Well, good news, everybody. The bureaucrats are at it again, saving us all from ourselves. As you know, petrol is quite an expensive thing, and these bureaucrats are so concerned about you and your cost of living and your wallet that they're going to make you drive more efficient cars, whether you like it or not, and whether you can afford it or not. This story comes to us courtesy of Joe Nova, a regular here at the Aussie Wire. Joe, thank you once again. Pleasure to be here, Ty friend. This is such an important topic. Australians really need to understand what's coming. Well, help us out, though, because what is coming? This, this doesn't necessarily mean a lot to people. Euro 6 fuel standards, what's, what are we talking about here? Well, we've seen a push in Europe and the US, and it hasn't made it to Australia, but it is about to. And what happens is they put these fuel emission standards on, which sound like a fine idea. Yes, let's make our air cleaner. But what it actually means in effect is that you won't get the choice of buying the car you want, and eventually you won't get the choice to keep the car that you want, and you won't get the choice to buy the petrol, the cheapest unleaded petrol that you want. And the rules coming out of Europe, and remembering Europe is far more uh, densely populated populated mm. 600 million people effectively in the same space as mm. what we've got in Australia with uh, 27 million people. So air quality is a completely different issue there than what it is here. Um, but we end up with a situation where you, you won't be able to run cheap cheaply from place to place. You'll be buying more expensive petrol and uh, they're saying so consumers will be able to now buy European <laughs> cars and they, they mean um expensive cars mm. and evs and things like that that it, you know they make out like it's such a win for consumers while they're denying consumers the right to do what consumers want it's not a free market this this strikes me as a bit of a let them eat cake moment where they're 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 sitting here and saying where aren't you lucky we're, we're going to adopt this latest standard that includes engines that are much more highly strung with much more narrow manufacturing tolerances and maintenance requirements and these sorts of things. I mean, there's a reason why these engines are more efficient. They require an enormous amount more engineering in order to be able to actually get them to operate in a way that can do this. As you've mentioned, they require more expensive petrol. And the government is basically saying, you now have to buy more expensive cars, whether you like it or not, you're welcome for us saving the environment. Is this just something that people are going to roll over and accept, do you think? Or do you think perhaps with the, the, the situation with the cost of living crisis that this might become a bit of a straw that breaks a camel's back? Look, it all depends on whether Australians understand what's coming or whether they just see the headlines because the media, of course, keeps reporting this as mm. if it's just about emission standards. Mm. But what it's also doing in the immediate effect is making uh, the government subsidies and discounts increase for EVs and decrease for hybrid cars. Mm. So where a hybrid kind of is the only EV that makes sense in Australia with our long distances, the, um, the, they're going to rule that out almost by, by cancelling some of the discounts on that and trying to force people into full EVs. I mean, mm. this obsession with EVs is kind of hard to explain given that you have to, EVs cost so much to build in terms of digging out all the minerals to mm. make the enormous half-tonne battery mm. and these minerals are coming from you know child slave labor kind of conditions and mm -hmm. <laughs> whatnot and by the time you look at all the energy put into an ev oh, you have gosh. to drive the thing for thousands of kilometers to even get back to neutral mm. so it's a very different it, 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 and plus if you don't know if the battery is going to last that long <laughs> Will it ever get back to neutral, right. especially if you scratch that EV and they have to write the whole thing mm. off because there's no way to test whether the battery on a car which just got a scratch, mm. no way to test whether that battery is not going to burst into flame three weeks afterwards. Mm. We, you, we can't do that yet. You've done some great work on that and I recommend everyone go to uh, joannenova.com and uh, check that out because you've done some great work over a long period of time on that. We'll put a link to that in the description. One of the, the great points that's been made online here, and, and this is from Craig Kelly, uh, Craig Kelly's um, X account. This is a, a headline from news.com.au and obviously been modified with some pictures here. But this is directly going to affect people who are now buying what are the most popular vehicles in Australia. So this is not as though it's something that's going to affect people at the margins, you know, a handful of people here and there. This is directly disincentivizing, and as you point out, will make far more expensive the most popular vehicles in Australia for the purpose of pushing people across to vehicles that really aren't suited to Australia at all. Is this, do you think, a part of this, you know, we're seeing bushland getting locked up, four-wheel drive tracks being locked up, hiking and, and rock climbing locations being locked up. Is this just a continuation of this idea that we, we ought to stay out of the natural environment and keep contained in our little cities? 
partly, but I think the big the big aim here is eventually to force everyone into EVs. And the reason for that is the digital cars. I think as we talked about before, the fact that when you're in an EV, you can be tracked, mm. traced. Mm. They can remotely stop the car. They can record your conversations. In fact, Subaru came out, uh, a, a man reading the Subaru terms and conditions put a blog post up, which I put on my website the other day, that mm. talks about how when you sit in a Subaru, so you don't own it, you're just a passenger, mm. you effectively agree for them to uh, own all of the information they get while you're sitting in the car. So they're recording conversations, they've got camera shots, face views, everything. Mm. It's all owned by Subaru. And we saw out of Germany recently, I think you remember, that what an insider from the insurance, uh, from a large insurance company warned us that they were going to be selling this data and that they ha- were thrilled, the insurance company was thrilled that the EU had just made laws which gave control of that data. It took it away from companies like Subaru mm. and gave it to the consumer, which sounds on the surface kind of good, except that when we know that the insurance companies and the government will probably then offer discounts to people who tick the box saying, yes, the government can have all my data. How Mm. fast am I going? Am I going to get a speeding ticket Mm. on the road while I drive today? Because the cameras, everything, the car will be telling on me all the way. Um, You know, obviously insurance companies want that kind of data when an accident happens, they'll get a lot more information about who's at fault. Mm. But there's a huge privacy question here that people are not aware of. Mm. So, yeah, it is, it's is—it's it's quite unnerving, their drive, this obsession with getting mm. people into EVs. It certainly isn't for the environment. Well, it's interesting because that privacy issue is already a very real one when it comes to smart TVs, you know, Amazon Alexas and these sorts of home assistants, uh, robot vacuum cleaners even. There are some very real privacy issues because, you know, your TV, for example, if it is, if, if it is not even on, if it just has electricity to it, it is listening. Uh, any device that can respond when you say, hey, Alexa, is listening to you all the time. And there's some very serious privacy issues around that. And we know that there have been instances where data has been being sent from people's homes without them really fully understanding the seriousness of that. And, and as you rightly point out, that's now beginning to happen inside what used to be one of the more private places, one of the more private places you could have a conversation with someone was on a long haul road trip from the passenger seat to the driver. So. That, uh, that privacy and, is gone. And Topher, just to expand on that, imagine mm. the kind of conversations people used to have in cars when mm. they thought they had privacy and the kind of things they say. They might say their boss is having an affair or something like that. Now, that information in the wrong hands mm. can end up being a blackmailable kind of thing mm. or it could be a market insider information. If someone's discussing something that isn't working well at the company or some trade deal they're doing, now, if that information falls into the hands of hackers, adversaries, enemies, people who want to play the market and make money out of it, suddenly it is extremely valuable information and Mm. it could do a lot of harm and damage to the idea of a free market, a free country and everything else. Mm. So, you know, people shouldn't think, well, you know, I'm not doing anything wrong. This can't hurt me. Absolutely. It will hurt you. It will cost you. Mm. And and if I can point out the the what's happened in uh, California and the EU, the really uh, sting in the tail with this legislation is that eventually they start making rules where the government says to the companies, you can only sell, say, one uh, in, in internal combustion engine for every two EVs you make. Yeah. Now, the effect of that rule, and the government will say, see, we're not controlling the market. We're not deciding what people buy and what they don't buy. Mm. But they're forcing the EV companies or the, the, the car manufacturers to build EVs. They're forcing them to sell two EVs for every single ice vehicle so what happens the price of the ice the internal combustion engines goes has to go up Mm. because the companies have to limit the number of sales of these standard cars that we all love Mm. and then they use the extra profits they make on those sales to discount the evs so what happens is a subsidy for electric vehicles so eventually the poor will be able to afford electric vehicles Mm. but the poor Mm. won't be able to afford uh, internal combustion engines mm. and the internal combustion engine cars that'll be something only the billionaires will be able to drive them out of the showroom mm. sooner or later mm. you know the ratio will be keep pushed you'll be shifting until evs are the common man's car mm. but as i said you know it, it, this is all subsidies for the super rich in a way but it always has been a, you, know, you reflect on the idea maybe perhaps someday the poor will be able to buy an EV but I'm not so sure that they'll be able to afford to recharge it the way that electricity prices are going in this country 
But subsidies are always a, a, a transfer of wealth from the poor to the rich. You think about subsidising an EV, even the way it has been done in the past, what we're saying is we're now going to take tax money off everybody, which includes mostly people who can't afford a new car, and we're going to give that to someone who can afford a new car, who by definition is already wealthier than the people we're taking that money from. That's always been the backbone of all of these schemes, is always a wealth transfer away from the poor towards those who are, comparatively speaking, relatively yeah. well-to-do. Sure. And it's just an extra sneaky way of doing it, the way the government can kind of say hands off, well, we're not deciding who buys what car. Everyone mm. still has free choice and there's still a free market, but it isn't a free no, market at all when close. the government dictates the ratio of cars to be sold. So what will happen is people who live in the inner city, largely the rich people in inner suburbs, will still be happy to buy an EV because EVs can work for them. Mm. And so they get the discount and the people out in the country and the farmers and people in outer suburbs, they're the ones who have to fork out so much more to buy an, mm. a, a, an internal combustion engine, petrol car, mm. and then they won't be able to buy the cheapest petrol as well. So, yeah, again, we get the poor and the outer suburbs subsidising the purchases of the people in the inner suburbs. Mm. So it, it, just crazy. Last thought. We're talking about Euro 6 emissions. The word Euro is in there for a reason. These are decisions that are being made literally on the opposite side of the planet where they have a very different uh, geography and a di very different population density, which you alluded to earlier. If you reflect on the fact that driving from the north of Italy to London is roughly equivalent to driving from Melbourne to Brisbane. It's, it's a little bit further, but not, not by all that much. Whose idea was it that we should just take rules that literally have Euro in the name and just apply them over here and assume that that's just going to work out just fine for us? Well, that's just it, isn't it? We find that kind of, and I, I don't like using the word globalist mm. because, but there's no better word in a way to talk about that elite layer of multinational, uh, international funding, the people mm. with money spread across countries who seem to be pushing the same rules on every single country in the West. Mm. And of course, there's the World Economic Forum, the UN, the giant cartels of bankers, the BlackRock vanguards, etc. All of these groups that seem to to be above the rules who also have an enormous pot of money to influence elections with in as much as they mm. can and who knows how that money sneaks its way into deals or job offers in the future mm. but we yes strangely every single country with its very different requirements is going to end up with almost the same laws kind of odd mm. food for thought i'm not a conspiracy theorist mm. but <clears throat> if you pay but there is a pattern there <laughs> and it's time to admit the pattern is that we are copying legislation which looks like it was made by EU snobs and bureaucrats and dictated to us and who knows maybe 10 years from now some members of our current government will get sweet jobs in the OECD or the IMF or the UN yep. or straight onto wherever. the boards of car and manufacturers because let's be honest what we're doing basically is saying Australians you're not allowed to buy the cars that are in your best interests. You have to buy the cars that are in the German manufacturer's best interests. And, and the German industry does need a lot of rescuing at the moment. It certainly does. They've made some very bad missteps. Look, Joe, that's all we have time for. Thank you once again. You're always amazing. Thank you for joining us on the Aussie Wire.